Chapter 1 of The Eagle's Shadow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John M. Wilson for Bureau 42. Used by LibriVox with his permission. The Eagle's Shadow by James Branch Cabell. To MLPB. In trust that the enterprise may be judged less by the merits of its factor than by those of its patron. 1. This is the story of Margaret Hugonin and of the Eagle. And with your permission, we will for the present defer all consideration of the bird and devote our unqualified attention to Margaret. I have always esteemed Margaret the obvious, sensible, most appropriate name that can be bestowed upon a girl child, for it is a name that fits a woman, any woman, as neatly as her proper size in gloves yes the first point i wish to make is that a woman child once baptized margaret is thereby insured of a suitable name be she grave or gay in after life wanton or pious or sullen comely or otherwise there will be no possible chance of incongruity whether she develop a taste for winter gardens or the higher mathematics whether she take to golf or clinging organdies the event is provided for one has only to consider for a moment and if among a choice of madge marjorie meta maggie margarita peggy and gretchen and countless others if among all these he cannot find a name that suits her to a t why then the case is indeed desperate and he may permissibly fall back upon madam or if the cat jump propitiously and at his own peril on darling or sweetheart the second proof that this name must be the best of all possible names is that margaret hugonin bore it and so the murder is out you may suspect what you choose i warn you in advance that i have no part whatever in her story and if my admiration for her given name appears somewhat excessive i can only protest that in this dissentient world every one has a right to his own taste i knew margaret i admired her and if in some unguarded moment i may have carried my admiration to the point of indiscretion her husband most assuredly knows all about it by this and he and i are still the best of friends so you perceive that if i ever did so far forget myself it could scarcely have amounted to a hanging matter i am doubly sure that margaret hugonin was beautiful for the reason that i have never found a woman under forty-five who shared my opinion if you clap a testament into my hand i cannot affirm that women are eager to recognize beauty in one another at the utmost they concede that this or that particular feature is well enough but when a woman is clean-eyed and straight-limbed and has a cheery heart she really cannot help being beautiful and when nature accords her a sufficiency of dimples and an infectious laugh i protest she is well-nigh irresistible and all these margaret hugonin had and surely that is enough i shall not endeavor then to picture her features to you in any nicely picked words her chief charm was that she was margaret and besides that mere carnal vanities are trivial things a gray eye or so is not in the least to the purpose yet since it is the immemorial custom of writer folk to inventory such possessions of their heroines here you have a catalogue of her personal attractions launce's method will serve our turn imprimis there was not very much of her five feet three at the most and hers was the well-groomed modern type that implies a grandfather or two and is in very respect the antithesis of that hulking venus of the louvre whom people pretend to admire item she had blue eyes and when she talked with you her head drooped forward a little the frank intent gaze of these eyes was very flattering and in its ultimate effect perilous since it led you fatuously to believe that she had forgotten there were any other trousered beings extant later on you found this a decided error item she had a quite incredible amount of yellow hair that was not in the least like gold or copper or bronze I scorn the hackneyed similes of metallurgical poets, but a straightforward yellow, darkening at the roots. 
and she wore it low down her neck in great coils that were held in place by a multitude of little golden hairpins and diverse corpulent tortoiseshell ones. Item, her nose was a tiny miracle of perfection. And this was noteworthy, for you will observe that nature, who is an adept at eyes and hairs and mouths, very rarely achieves a creditable nose. Item, she had a mouth. And if you are a grad Grindian with a taste for hair splitting, I cannot swear that it was a particularly small mouth. The lips were rather full than otherwise. One saw in them potentialities of heroic passion and tenderness and generosity and, if you will, temper. No, her mouth was not in the least like the pink shoe button of romance and sugared portraiture. It was manifestly designed less for simpering out of a gilt frame or the dribbling of stock phrases over three hundred pages than for jibes and laughter and cheery gossip and honest, unromantic eating, as well as another purpose which, as a highly dangerous topic, I decline even to mention. There you have the best description of Margaret Hugona that I am capable of giving you. No one realizes its glaring inadequacy more acutely than I. Furthermore, I stipulate that if in the progress of our comedy she appeared to act with an utter lack of reason or even common sense, as every woman worth the winning must do once or twice in a lifetime, that I be permitted to record the fact, to set it down in all its ugliness, nay, even to exaggerate it a little, all to the end that I may eventually exasperate you and goad you into crying out, Come, come, you are not treating the girl with common justice. For, if such a thing were possible, I should desire you to rival even me in a liking for Margaret Hugonan. And speaking for myself, I can assure you that I have come long ago to regard her faults with the same leniency that I accord my own. 2. We begin on a fine May morning, in Colonel Hugonan's rooms at Selwood, which is, as you may or may not know, the Hugonan's country place. And there we discover the colonel dawdling over his breakfast, in an intermediate stage of that careful toilet, which enables him later in the day to pass casual inspection as turning forty-nine. At present the old gentleman is discussing the members of his daughter's house party. We will omit, by your leave, a number of picturesque descriptive passages, for the colonel is, on occasion, a man of unfettered speech, and come hastily to the conclusion, to the summing up of the whole matter. Altogether, says Colonel Hugonan, they strike me as being the most ungodly menagerie ever gotten together under one roof since Noah landed on Ararat. Now, I am sorry that veracity compels me to present the Colonel in this particular state of mind, for ordinarily he was as pleasant spoken a gentleman as you will be apt to meet on the longest summer day. You must make allowances for the fact that on this special morning he was still suffering from a recent twinge of the gout, and that his toast was somewhat drier than he liked it, and most potent of all that the foreign mail just in had caused him to rebel anew against the proprieties and his daughter's inclinations, which chained him to Selwood in the height of the full London season, to preside over a house party every member of which he cordially disliked. Therefore, the colonel, having glanced through the well-known names of those at Lady Pevensey's last cotillion, groaned and glared at his daughter, who sat opposite him, and reviled his daughter's friends with point and fluency, and characterized them as above, for the reason that he was hungered at heart for the shady side of Paul Mall, and that their presence at Selwood prevented his attaining this Elysium for I am sorry to say that the colonel loathed all things American, saving his daughter, whom he worshipped. And I think no one who could have seen her preparing his second cup of tea would have disputed that in making this exception he acted with a show of reason. For Margaret Hugonin, but, as you know, she is our heroine, and as I fear you have already learned, words are very paltry makeshifts when it comes to describing her. Let us simply say, then, that Margaret, his daughter, began to make him a cup of tea, and add that she laughed. Not unkindly, no, for at bottom she adored her father, a comely Englishman of some sixty-odd, who had run through his wife's fortune and his own in the most gallant fashion, and she accorded his opinions a conscientious, 
but at times a sorely taxed, tolerance. That very month she had reached twenty-three, the age of omniscience, when the fallacies and general obtuseness of older people became dishearteningly apparent. It's nonsense, pursued the old gentleman, utter bedlamite nonsense filling Selwood up with writing people. Never heard of such a thing. Gad, I do remember as a young man meeting Thackeray at a garden party at Orleans' house. Gentlemanly fellow with a broken nose, and Browning went out a bit, too, now I think of it. People had em one at a time to lend flavor to a dinner, like an olive. We didn't dine on olives, though. You have em for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and everything. I'm sick of olives, I tell you, Margaret. Margaret pouted. They ain't even good olives. I looked into one of that fellow Chartres books the other day. That chap you had here last week. It was bally rot. Proverbs standing on their heads and grinning like dwarfs in a condemned street fair. Who wants to be told that impropriety is the spice of life and that a roving eye gathers remorse? You may call that sort of thing cleverness if you like. I call it damn foolishness. And the emphasis with which he said this left no doubt that the colonel spoke his honest opinion. Attractive, said his daughter patiently. Mr. Chartres is very, very clever. Mr. Canaston says literature suffered a considerable loss when he began to write for the magazines. And now that Margaret has spoken, permit me to call your attention to her voice. Mellow and suave and of astonishing volume was Margaret's voice. It came not from the back of her throat, as most of our women's voices do, but from her chest. And I protest it had the timbre of a violin. Men, hearing her voice for the first time, were wont to stare at her a little and afterward to close their hands slowly, for always its modulations had the tonic sadness of distant music, and it thrilled you to much the same magnanimity and yearning, cloudily conceived, and yet you could not but smile in spite of yourself at the quaint emphasis fluttering through her speech, and pouncing for the most part on the unlikeliest word in the whole sentence. But I fancy the colonel must have been tone-deaf. Don't you make phrases for me? he snorted. You keep em for your menagerie. Think. By God, the world never thinks. I believe the world deliberately reads the six best-selling books in order to incapacitate itself for thinking. Then, his wrath gathering emphasis as he went on, the longer I live, the plainer I see Shakespeare was right. What fools these mortals be at all that? There's that haggage woman, speech-making through the country like a Hiatus politician! It may be philanthropic, but it ain't ladylike, no begad. What has she got to do with juvenile courts and child labor in the South, I'd like to know. Why ain't she at home? Attending to that crippled boy of hers, poor little beggar, instead of flaunting through America, meddling with other folks' children. Miss Hugonan put another lump of sugar into his cup and deigned no reply. By God, cried the colonel fervently. If you're so anxious to spend that money of yours in charity, why don't you found a day nursery for the children of philanthropists? A place where advanced men and women can leave their offspring in capable hands when they are busied with mothers' meetings and educational conferences. We do a thousand times more good, I can tell you, than that fresh kindergarten scheme of yours for teaching the children of the laboring classes to make a new sort of mud pie. You don't understand these things attractive, Margaret gently pointed out. You aren't in harmony with the trend of modern thought. No, thank God, said the colonel heartily. Ensued a silence during which he chipped at his eggshell in an absent-minded fashion. That fellow Canaston said anything to you yet? He presently queried. I, I don't understand, she protested. Oh, perfectly unconvincingly. The tea-making, too, engrossed her at this point to an utterly improbable extent. Thus it shortly befell that the colonel, still regarding her under intent brows, cleared his throat and made bold to question her generosity in the matter of sugar, five lumps being, as he suggested, a rather unusual allowance for one cup. Then, Mr. Canaston and I are very good friends, said she, with dignity, and having spoiled the first cup in the making, she began on another. Glad to hear it, growled the old gentleman. I hope you value his friendship sufficiently not to marry him. The man's a fraud, a flimsy, sickening fraud, like his poetry, begad. 
and that's made up of botany and wide margins and indecency in about equal proportions. It ain't fit for a woman to read. In fact, a woman ought not to read anything. A comprehension of the Decalogue and the cookery book is enough learning for the best of them. Your mother never, never, Colonel Hugo then paused and stared at the open window for a little. He seemed to be interested in something a great way off. We used to read Ouida's books together, he said somewhat wistfully. Lord, Lord, how she reveled in Chandus and Bertie Cecil and those dashing life guardsmen. And she used to toss that little head of hers and say I was a finer figure of a man than any of them. Thirty years ago, good Lord. And I was then, but I ain't now. Only a broken-down, cantankerous old fool, declared the colonel, blowing his nose violently. And that's why I'm quarreling with the dearest, foolishest daughter a man ever had. Ah, oh, my dear, don't mind me. Run your menagerie as you like, and I'll stand it. Margaret adopted her usual tactics. She perched herself on the arm of his chair and began to stroke his cheek very gently. She often wondered as to what dear sort of a woman that tender-eyed, pink-cheeked mother of the old miniature had been, the mother who had died when she was two years old. She loved the idea of her, vague as it was, and just now, somehow, the notion of two grown people reading Ouida did not strike her as being especially ridiculous. Was she very beautiful? she asked softly. My dear, said her father, you are the picture of her. You dangerous old man, said she, laughing and rubbing her cheek against his, in a manner that must have been highly agreeable. Dear, do you know that is the nicest little compliment I've had for a long time? Thereupon the colonel chuckled. Pay me for it then, said he, by driving the dog cart over to meet Billy's train today, eh? I, I can't, said Miss Hugonan promptly. Why? demanded her father. Because, said Miss Hugonan, and after giving this really excellent reason, reflected for a moment and strengthened it by adding, Because. See here, her father questioned. What did you two quarrel about anyway? I, I really don't remember, said she reflectively, then continued with hauteur and some inconsistency. I am not aware that Mr. Woods and I have ever quarreled. By God, then, said the colonel. You may as well prepare to, for I intend to marry you to Billy some day. Dear, dear child, he interpolated with malice aforethought. Have you a fever? Your cheek's like a coal. Billy's a man, I tell you, with a dozen of your canastins and shawltries. I like Billy, and besides, it's only right he should have Selwood. Wasn't he brought up to expect it? It ain't right he should lose it simply because he had a quarrel with Frederick, for by gad... Not to speak unkindly of the dead, my dear. Frederick quarreled with everyone he ever knew, from the woman who nursed him to the doctor who gave him his last pill. He may have gotten his genius for money-making from heaven, but he certainly got his temper from the devil. I really believe, said the colonel reflectively, it was worse than mine. Yes, not a doubt of it. I'm a lamb in comparison. But he had his way after all, and even now poor Billy can't get Selwood without taking you with it. And he caught his daughter's face between his hands and turned it toward his for a moment. I wonder now, said he in meditative wise, if Billy will consider that a drawback. It seemed very improbable. Any number of marriageable males would have sworn it was unthinkable. However, of course, Margaret began in a crisp voice, if you advise Mr. Woods to marry me as a good speculation... But her father caught her up with a whistle. Eh? said he. Love in a cottage? Is it thus the poet turns his lay? That's damn nonsense. I tell you, even in a cottage, the plumber's bill has to be paid, and the grocer's little account settled every month. Yes, by God, and even if you elect to live on bread and cheese and kisses, you'll find camembert a little bit more to your taste than Schweitzer. But I don't want to marry anybody. You ridiculous old dear, said Margaret. Oh, very well, said the old gentleman. Don't. Be an old maid and lecture before the mother's club if you like. I don't care. Anyhow, you meet Billy today at 12.45. You will? That's a good child. Now run along and tell the menagerie I'll be downstairs as soon as I've finished dressing. And the colonel rang for his man and proceeded to finish his toilet. He seemed to thought absent-minded this morning. 
I say, Wilkins, he questioned after a little, have you read any of Weeder's books? Oh, yes, sir, said Wilkins. Miss Anderson, Mrs. Aggage's maid, that is, sir, was reading her loud hout of hundred two flags only last evening, sir. Hm. Mm. Wilkins, if you can run across one of them in the servants' quarters, you might leave it by my bed tonight. Yes, sir. And, hm, Wilkins, you can put it under that book of Herbert Spencer's my daughter gave me yesterday. Under it, Wilkins, and, hm, Wilkins, you needn't mention it to anybody. We ain't cultured, Wilkins, but she's damn good reading. I suppose that's why she ain't cultured, Wilkins. Three. And now let us go back a little. In a word, let us utilize the next twenty minutes, during which Miss Hugonin drives to the neighboring railway station in, if you press me, not the most pleasant state of mind conceivable, by explaining a thought more fully to the posture of affairs at Selwood on the May morning that starts our story. And to do this, I must commence with the nature of the man who founded Selwood. It was when the nineteenth century was still a hearty octogenarian that Frederick R. Woods caused Selwood to be builded. I give you the name by which he was known on The Street. A mythology has grown about the name since, and strange legends of its owner are still narrated where brokers congregate. But with the lambs he sheared, and the bulls he dragged to earth, and the bears he gored to financial death, we have nothing to do. Suffice it that he performed these operations with almost uniform success and in an unimpeachably respectable manner. And if, in his time, he added materially to the list of inmates in various asylums and almshouses, it must be acknowledged that he bore his victims no malice, and that on every Sunday morning he confessed himself to be a miserable sinner, in a voice that was perfectly audible three pews off. At bottom, I think he considered his relations with heaven on a purely business basis. He kept a species of running account with Providence, and if on occasions he overdrew it somewhat, he saw no incongruity in evening matters with a check for the church fund, so that at his death it was said of him that he had, in his day, sent more men into bankruptcy and more missionaries into Africa than any other man in the country. In his sixty-fifth year he caught Alfred Van Orden short in lard, erected a memorial window to his wife, and became a country gentleman. He never set foot in Wall Street again. He builded Selwood, a handsome Tudor manor, which stands some seven miles from the village of Fairhaven, where he dwelt in state, by turns affable and domineering to the neighboring farmers, and evincing a grave interest in the condition of their crops. He no longer turned to the financial reports in the papers, and the pedigree of the Woodses hung in the living hall for all men to see, beginning gloriously with Woden, the Scandinavian god, and attaining a respectable culmination in the names of Frederick R. Woods and of William, his brother. It is not to be supposed that he omitted to supply himself with a coat of arms. Frederick R. Woods evinced an almost childlike pride in his heraldic blazonings. The Woods' arms, he would inform you with a relishing gusto, are vert, an eagle displayed, barry argent and jewels and the crest is out of a ducal coronet, or a demi-eagle proper. We have no motto, sir. None of your ancient coats have mottos. The woods eagle he gloried in. The bird was perched in every available nook at Selwood. It was carved in the woodwork, was set in the mosaics, was chased in the tableware, was woven in the napery, was glazed in the very china. Turn where you would, an eagle or two confronted you, and Hunston Wick, who was accounted something of a wit, swore that Frederick R. Woods at Selwood reminded him of a sore-headed bear who had taken up permanent quarters in an aviary. There was one, however, who found the bear no very untractable monster. This was the son of his brother, dead now, who dwelt at Selwood as heir presumptive. Frederick R. Woods' wife had died long ago, leaving him childless. His brother's boy was an orphan, and so, for a time, he and the grim old man lived together peaceably enough. Indeed, Billy Woods was, in those days, as fine a lad as you would wish to see, with the eyes of an inquisitive cherub, and a big toe-head, which Frederick R. Woods fell into the habit of cuffing heartily, in order to conceal the fact that he would have burned Selwood to the ground, rather than allow anyone else to injure a hair of it. 
In the consummation of time, Billy, having attained the ripe age of eighteen, announced to his uncle that he intended to become a famous painter. Frederick R. Woods exhorted him not to be a fool and packed him off to college. Billy Woods returned on his first vacation with a fragmentary mustache and any quantity of paint tubes, canvases, palettes, mall sticks, and such like paraphernalia. Frederick R. Woods passed over the mustache and had the painter's trappings burned by the second footman. Billy promptly purchased another lot. His uncle came upon them one morning, rubbed his chin meditatively for a moment, and laughed for the first time, so far as known, in his lifetime. Then he tiptoed to his own apartments, lest Billy, the lazy young rascal was still abed in the next room, should awaken and discover his knowledge of this act of flat rebellion. I dare say the old gentleman was so completely accustomed to having his own way that this unlooked-for opposition tickled him by its novelty. Or perhaps he recognized in Billy an obstinacy akin to his own. Or perhaps it was merely that he loved the boy. In any event, he never again alluded to the subject, and it is a fact that when Billy sent for carpenters to convert an upper room into an atelier, Frederick R. Woods spent two long and dreary weeks in Boston in order to remain in ignorance. Billy scrambled through college, somehow, in the allotted four years. At the end of that time, he returned to find new inmates installed at Selwood. For the wife of Frederick R. Woods had been, before her marriage, one of the beautiful Anne Struther sisters, who, as certain New Yorkers still remember, those grizzled, portly, rosy, gilled fellows who prattle on provocation of Jenny Lind and Castle Garden and remember everything, created a pronounced furor at their debut in the days of Crinoline and the Grishin Bend. And Margaret Anstruther, as they will tell you, was married to Thomas Hugonin, then a gallant cavalry officer in the service of Her Majesty, the Empress of India. And she must have been the nicer of the two, because everybody who knew her says that Margaret Hugonin is exactly like her. So it came about naturally enough that Billy Woods, now an Artium Baccalaureus, if you please, and not a little proud of it, found the colonel and his daughter then on a visit to this country, installed at Selwood as guests and quasi-relatives. And Billy was twenty-two, and Margaret was nineteen. Precisely what happened I'm able to tell you. Billy Woods claims it is none of my business, and Margaret says that it was a long, long time ago and she really can't remember, but I fancy we can all form a very fair notion of what is most likely to occur when two sensible, normal, healthy young people are thrown together in this intimate fashion at a country house where the remaining company consists of two elderly gentlemen. Billy was forced to be polite to his uncle's guest, and Margaret couldn't well be discourteous to her host's nephew, could she? Of course not. So it befell in the course of time that Frederick R. Woods and the colonel, who had quickly become a great favorite by virtue of his implicit faith in the eagle and in Woden and Sir Percival de Vaux of Hastings, and such like flights of heraldic fancy, and had augmented his popularity by his really brilliant suggestion of Winken de Vord, the famous 16th century printer, as a probable collateral relation of the family, it came to pass, as I say, that the two gentlemen nodded over their port and chuckled and winked at one another and agreed that the thing would do. This was all very well, but they failed to make allowances for the inevitable quarrel and the subsequent spectacle of the gentlemen contemplating suicide, and the lady looking wistfully toward a nunnery. In this case, it arose, I believe, over Teddy Anstruther, who, for a cousin, was undeniably very attentive to Margaret, and in the natural course of events, they would have made it up before the week was out, had not Frederick R. Wood selected this very moment to interfere in the matter. Ah, si vieux les savais. The blundering old man summoned Billy into his study and ordered him to marry Margaret Hugonin, precisely as the colonel might have ordered a private to go on sentry duty. Ten days earlier, Billy would have jumped at the chance. Ten days later, he would probably have suggested it himself, but at that exact moment, he would have as willingly contemplated matrimony with Alecto, or Medusa, or any of the Furies. Accordingly, he declined. Frederick R. Woods flew into a pyrotechnical display of temper and gave him his choice between obeying his commands and leaving his house forever. The choice, in fact, which he had been according Billy at very brief intervals ever since the boy had had the measles fifteen years before 
and had refused to take the proper medicines. It was merely his usual manner of expressing a request or a suggestion, but this time, to his utter horror and amaze, the boy took him at his word and left Selwood within the hour. Billy's life, you see, was irrevocably blighted. It mattered very little what became of him. Personally, he didn't care in the least. But as for that fair, false, fickle woman, perish the thought. Sooner a thousand deaths. No, he would go to Paris and become a painter of worldwide reputation. The money his father had left him would easily suffice for his simple wants. And some day, the observed of all observers in some bright hall of gaiety, he would pass her coldly by with a cynical smile upon his lips, and she would grow pale and totter and fall into the arms of the bloated Silenus, for whose title she had bartered her purely superficial charms. Yes, upon mature deliberation, that was precisely what Billy decided to do. Followed dark days at Selwood, Frederick R. Woods told Margaret of what had occurred, and he added the information that, as his wife's nearest relative, he intended to make her his heir. Then Margaret did what I would scarcely have expected of Margaret. She turned upon him like a virago and informed Frederick R. Woods precisely what she thought of him. She acquainted him with the fact that he was a sordid, low-minded, grasping beast, and a miser, and a tyrant, and I think a parricide. She notified him that he was thoroughly unworthy to wipe the dust of his nephew's shoes, an office toward which, to do him justice, he had never shown any marked aspirations, and that Billy had acted throughout in a most noble and sensible manner, and that personally she wouldn't marry Billy Woods if he were the last man on earth, for she had always despised him, and she added the information that she expected to die shortly, and she hoped that they would be both sorry then and subsequently she clapped the climax by throwing her arms about his neck and bursting into tears and telling him he was the dearest old man in the world and that she was thoroughly ashamed of herself. So they kissed and made it up, and after a little the colonel and Margaret went away from Selwood, and Frederick R. Woods was left alone to nourish his anger and indignation, if he could, and to hunger for his boy, whether he would or not. He was too proud to seek him out. Indeed, he never thought of that. And so he waited, alone in his fine house, sick at heart, impotent, hoping against hope that the boy would come back. The boy never came. No, the boy never came because he was what the old man had made him, headstrong and willful and obstinate. Billy had been thoroughly spoiled. The old man had nurtured his pride and applauded it as a mark of proper spirit and now it was this same pride that had robbed him of the one thing he loved in all the world. So at last the weak point in the armor of this sturdy old Pharisee was found, and fate had pierced it gaily. It was retribution, if you will, and I think that none of his victims in the street, none of the countless widows and orphans that he had made, suffered more bitterly than he in those last days. It was almost two years after Billy's departure from Selwood that his body servant, coming to rouse Frederick R. Woods one June morning, found him dead in his rooms. He had been ailing for some time. It was his heart, the doctors said, and I think that it was, though not precisely in the sense which they meant. The man found him seated before his great carved desk on which his head and shoulders had fallen forward. They rested on a sheet of legal cap paper half covered with a calculation in his crabbed old hand as to the value of certain properties, the calculation which he never finished, and underneath was a mass of miscellaneous papers, among them his will, dated the day after Billy left Selwood, in which Frederick R. Woods bequeathed his millions unconditionally to Margaret Hugonin when she should come of age. Her twenty-first birthday had fallen in the preceding month, so Margaret, was one of the richest women in America, and you may depend upon it that if many men had loved her before, they worshipped her now, or at least said they did, and after all, their protestations were the only means she had of judging. She might have been a countess, and it must be owned that the old colonel, who had an honest Anglo-Saxon reverence for a title, saw this chance lost wistfully, and she might have married any number of grammarless gentlemen personally unknown to her 
whose fervent proposals almost every male brought in and besides these there were many others more orthodox in their wooing some of whom were genuinely in love with margaret hugo and then some i grieve to admit who were genuinely in love with her money and she would have none of them she refused them all with the utmost civility as i happen to know how i learned it is no affair of yours for miss Hugonin had remarkably keen eyes which she used to advantage in the world about her they discovered very little that she could admire she was none the happier for her wealth the piled-up millions overshadowed her personality and it was not long before she knew that most people regarded her simply as the heiress of the wood's fortune an unavoidable encumbrance attached to the property which diverse thrifty-minded gentlemen were willing to put up with to put up with at the thought her pride rose in a hot blush and it must be confessed she sought consolation in the looking-glass she was an humble-minded young woman as the sex goes and she saw no great reason there why a man should go mad over margaret hugonan this decision i grant you was preposterous for there were any number of reasons her final conclusion however was for the future to regard all men as fortune hunters and to do her hair differently she carried out both resolutions when a gentleman grew pressing in his attentions she more than suspected his motives and when she eventually declined him it was done with perfect courtesy but the glow of her eyes was at such times accentuated to a marked degree meanwhile the eagle brooded undisturbed at selwood miss hugonan would allow nothing to be altered the place doesn't belong to me attractive she would tell her father i belong to the place yes i do i'm exactly like a little cow thrown in with a little farm when they sell it and all my little suitors think so and they are very willing to take me on those terms too but they shan't attractive i hate every single solitary man in the whole wide world but you beautiful and i particularly hate that horrid old eagle but we'll keep him because he's a constant reminder to me that solomon or moses or whoever it was that said all men were liars was a person of very great intelligence so that i think we may fairly say the money did her no good if it benefited no one else it was not margaret's fault she had a high sense of her responsibilities and therefore at various times endeavored to further the spread of philanthropy and literature and theosophy and art and temperance and education and other laudable causes mr canaston in his laughing manner was wont to jest at her varied enterprises and term her lady bountiful but then mr canaston had no real conception of the proper uses of money in fact he never thought of money he admitted this to margaret with a whimsical sigh margaret grew very fond of mr canaston because he was not mercenary mr canaston was much at selwood many people came there now masculine women and muscleless men for the most part they had every one of them some scheme for bettering the universe and if among them margaret seemed somewhat out of place a butterfly among earnest-minded ants her heart was in every plan they advocated and they found her purse strings infinitely elastic the girl was pitiably anxious to be of some use in the world so at selwood they gossiped of great causes and furthered the millennium and above them the eagle brooded in silence and billy all this time billy was junketing abroad where every year he painted masterpieces for the salon which on account of a nefarious conspiracy among certain artists jealous of his superior merits were invariably refused now billy is back again in america and the colonel has insisted that he come to selwood and margaret is waiting for him in the dog-cart the glow of her eyes is very very bright her father's careless words this morning coupled with certain speeches of mr canaston's last night had given her food for reflection he wouldn't dare says margaret to no one in particular oh no he wouldn't dare after what happened four years ago and margaret like she has quite forgotten that what happened four years ago was all caused by her having flirted outrageously with teddy anstruther in order to see what billy would do end of chapter three chapter four of the eagle's shadow by james branch cabell this librivox recording is in the public domain 
Recording by John M. Wilson, originally released through Bureau 42. Donated to LibriVox with his express permission. 4. The 1245, for a wonder, was on time, and there descended from it a big, blonde young man, who did not look in the least like a fortune hunter. Miss Hugonan resented this. Manifestly, he looked clean and honest for the deliberate purpose of deceiving her. Very well, she'd show him. He was quite unembarrassed. He shook hands cordially, then he shook hands with the groom, who, you may believe it, was grinning in a most unprofessional manner because Master Billy was back again at Selwood. Subsequently, in his old decisive way, he announced they would walk to the house, as his legs needed stretching. The insolence of it! Quite as if he had something to say to Margaret in private and couldn't wait a minute. Beyond doubt, this was a young man who must be taken down a peg or two, and that at once. Of course, she wasn't going to walk back with him, a pretty figure they'd cut strolling through the fields, like a house girl and a milkman on a Sunday afternoon. She would simply say she was too tired to walk, and that would end the matter. So she said she thought the exercise would do them both good. They came presently with desultory chat to a meadow bravely decked in all the gods of spring. About them the day was clear, the air bland. Spring had revamped her ageless fripperies of tender leaves and bird cries and sweet, warm odors for the adornment of this meadow. Above it she had set a Turkish sky, splashed here and there with little clouds that were like whipped cream, and upon it she had scattered largesse, a denies shower of buttercups. Altogether she had made of it a particularly dangerous meadow for a man and a maid to frequent. Yet there Mr. Woods paused under a burgeoning maple, paused resolutely, with the lures of spring thick about him, compassed with every snare of scent and sound and color that the witch is a mistress of. Margaret hoped he had a pleasant passage over. Her father, thank you, is in the pink of condition. Oh, yes, she was quite well. She hoped Mr. Woods would not find America. Well, Peggy, said Mr. Woods, then we'll have it out right here. His insolence was so surprising that, in order to recover herself, Margaret actually sat down under the maple tree. Peggy, indeed! Why, she hadn't been called Peggy for, no, not for four whole years. Because I intend to be friends, you know, said Mr. Woods. And about them the maple leaves made a little island of somber green, around which more vivid grasses rippled and dimpled under the fitful spring breezes and everywhere leaves lisped to one another, and birds shrilled insistently. It was a perilous locality. I fancy Billy Woods was out of his head when he suggested being friends in such a place. Friends indeed. You would have thought from the airy confidence with which he spoke that Margaret had come safely to forty year and wore steel-rimmed spectacles. But Miss Hugonan merely cast down her eyes, and was aware of no reason why they shouldn't be. She was sure he must be hungry, and she thought luncheon must be ready by now. In his soul, Mr. Woods observed that her lashes were long, long beyond all reason. Lacking the numbers that Petrarch flowed in, he did not venture even to himself to characterize them further. But oh, how queer it was that they should be pure gold at the roots. She must have dipped them in the ink pot. And oh, the strong, sudden, bewildering curve of them. He could not recall at the present moment ever noticing quite such lashes anywhere else. No, it was highly improbable that there were such lashes anywhere else. Perhaps a few of the superior angels might have had such lashes. He resolved for the future to attend church more regularly. Aloud, Mr. Woods observed that in that case they had better shake hands. It would have been ridiculous to contest the point. The dignified course was to shake hands, since he insisted on it, and then to return at once to Selwood. Margaret Hugonan had a pretty hand and Mr. Woods, as an artist, could not well fail to admire it. Still, he needn't have looked at it as though he had never before seen anything quite like it. He needn't have neglected to return it, and when Miss Hugonan reclaimed it, after a decent interval, he needn't have laughed, in a manner that compelled her to laugh too. These things were unnecessary and annoying, as they caused Margaret to forget that she despised him. For the time being, will you believe it? She actually thought he was rather nice. I acted like an ass, said Mr. Woods tragically. Oh, yes, I did, you know. But if you'll forgive me, 
for having been an ass. I'll forgive you for throwing me over for Teddy Anstruther. And at the wedding, I'll dance through any number of pairs of patent leathers you choose to mention. So that was the way at it. Teddy Anstruther, indeed. Why, Teddy was a dark little man with brown eyes. Just the sort of man she most objected to. How could anyone ever possibly fancy a brown-eyed man? Then, for no apparent reason, Margaret flushed. And Billy, who had stretched his great length of limb on the grass beside her, noted it with a pair of the bluest eyes in the world, and thought it vastly becoming. Billy, said she impulsively, and the name, having slipped out once by accident, it would have been absurd to call him anything else afterward. It was horrid of you to refuse to take any of that money. But I didn't want it, he protested. Good Lord, I'd only have done something foolish with it. It was awfully square of you, Peggy, to offer to divide, but I didn't want it, you see. I don't want to be a millionaire and give up the rest of my life to founding libraries and explaining to people that if they never spend any money on amusements, they'll have a great deal by the time they're too old to enjoy it. I'd rather paint pictures. So that I think Margaret must have endeavored at some time to make him accept part of Frederick R. Woods's money. You make me feel and look like a thief, she reproved him. Then Billy laughed a little. You don't look in the least like one, he reassured her. You look like an uncommonly honest, straightforward young woman, Mr. Woods added handsomely, and I don't believe you'd purloin under the severest temptation. She thanked him for his testimonial with all three dimples in evidence. This was unsettling. He hedged. Except, perhaps, said he. Yes, queried Margaret after a pause. However, she questioned him with her head drooped forward, her brows raised. And as this gave him the full effect of her eyes, Mr. Woods became quite certain that there was at least one thing she might be expected to rob him of and wisely declined to mention it. Margaret did not insist on knowing what it was. Perhaps she heard it thumping under his waistcoat, where it was behaving very queerly. So they sat in silence for a while. Then Margaret fell a-humming to herself, and the air, will you believe it, chanced by the purest accident to be that foolish, senseless old song they used to sing together four years ago. Billy chuckled. Let's, he obscurely pleaded. Spring prompted her. Oh, where have you been, Billy boy? queried Margaret's wonderful contralto. Oh, where have you been, Billy boy, Billy boy? Oh, where have you been, charming Billy? She sang it in a low, hushed voice just over her breath, not looking at him, however. And oh, what a voice, thought Billy Woods, a voice that was honey and gold and velvet and all that is most sweet and rich and soft in the world. Find me another voice like that, you prima donna. Find me a simile for it, you uninventive poets. Indeed, I'd like to see you do it. But he chimed in, nevertheless, with his pleasant, throaty baritone, and lifted his own part quite creditably. I've been to seek a wife. She's the joy of my life. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. Only Billy sang it father, just as they used to do. And when they sang it through, did Margaret and Billy, sang of the dimple in her chin and the ringlets in her hair, and of the cherry pies she achieved with such celerity, sang as they sat in the spring-decked meadow every word of that inane old song that is so utterly senseless and so utterly unforgettable. It was a quite idiotic performance. I set it down to the snares of spring, to her insidious, delightful snares of scent and sound and color that, for the moment at least, had trapped these young people into loving life infinitely. But I wonder who is responsible for that tatter of rhyme and melody that had come to them from nowhere in particular. Mr. Woods, as he sat up at the conclusion of the singing vigorously to applaud, would have shared his last possession, his ultimate crust, with that unknown benefactor of mankind. Indeed, though, the heart of Mr. Woods just now was full of loving kindness and capable of any freakish magnanimity. For will it be believed, Mr. Woods, who four years ago had thrown over a fortune and exiled himself from his native land, rather than propose marriage to Margaret Hugonan, had no sooner come again into her presence and looked once into her perfectly fathomless eyes 
then he could no more have left her of his own accord than a moth can turn his back to a lighted candle. He had fancied himself entirely cured of that boy and girl nonsense. His broken heart after the first few months had not interfered in the least with a naturally healthy appetite. And behold, here was the old malady raging again in his veins, and with renewed fervor. And all because the girl had a pretty face. I think you will agree with me that in the conversation I have recorded, Margaret had not displayed any great wisdom, or learning, or tenderness, or wit, nor in fine any of the qualities a man might naturally look for in a helpmate. Yet at the precise moment he handed his baggage check to the groom, Mr. Woods had made up his mind to marry her. In an instant he had fallen head over heels in love, or to whittle accuracy to a point, he had discovered that he had never fallen out of love. And if you had offered him an empress, or fetched Helen of Troy from the grave for his delectation, he would have laughed you to scorn. In his defense, I can only plead that Margaret was an unusually beautiful woman. It is all very well to flourish a death's head at the feast and bid my lady go paint herself an inch thick, for to this favor she must come. And it is quite true that the reddest lips in the universe may give vent to slander and lies, and the brightest eyes be set in the dullest head, and the most roseate of complexions be purchased at the corner drug store. But say what you will, a pretty woman is a pretty woman, and while she continues so, no amount of common sense or experience will prevent a man on provocation from alluring, coaxing, even treating her to make a fool of him. We like it, and I think they like it too. So Mr. Woods lost his heart on a fine spring morning, and was unreasonably elated over the fact. And Margaret? Margaret was content. 5. They talked for a matter of a half hour in the fashion aforetime recorded. Not very wise nor witty talk, if you will, but very pleasant to make. There were many pauses. There was much laughter over nothing in particular. There were any number of sentences ambitiously begun that ended nowhere. Altogether, it was just the sort of talk for a man and a maid. Yet some twenty minutes later, Mr. Woods, preparing for luncheon in the privacy of his chamber, gave a sudden exclamation. Then he sat down and rumpled his hair thoroughly. Good Lord, he groaned. I'd forgotten all about that damned money. Oh, you ass. You abject ass. Why, she's one of the richest women in America. And you're only a fifth-rate painter, with a paltry thousand or so a year. You marry her. Why, I dare say she's refused a hundred men better than you. She'd think you were mad. Why, she'd think you were after the money. She, oh, she'd only think you a precious cheeky ass, she would. And she'd be quite right. You are an ass, Billy Woods. You ought to be locked up in some nice, quiet stable where your hee-hawing wouldn't disturb people. You need a keeper, you do. He sat for some ten minutes aghast. Afterward, he rose and threw back his shoulders and drew a deep breath. No, we aren't an ass, he addressed his reflection in the mirror, as he carefully knotted his tie. We're only a poor, chuckle-headed moth who's been looking at a star too long. It's a bright star, Billy, but it isn't for you. So we're going to be sensible now. We're going to get a telegram tomorrow that will call us away from Selwood. We aren't coming back any more either. We're simply going to continue painting fifth-rate pictures and hoping that some day she'll find the right man and be very, very happy. Nevertheless, he decided that a blue tie would look better and was very particular in arranging it. At the same moment, Margaret stood before her mirror and tidied her hair for luncheon and assured her image in the glass that she was a weak-minded fool. She pointed out to herself the undeniable fact that Billy, having formerly refused to marry her, oh, ignominy, seemed pleasant-spoken enough now that she had become an heiress. His refusal to accept part of her fortune was a very flimsy device. It simply meant he hoped to get all of it. Oh, he did, did he? Margaret powdered her nose viciously. She saw through him. His honest bearing she very plainly perceived to be the result of consummate hypocrisy. In his laughter her keen ear detected a hollow ring, and his courteous manner she found at bottom mere servility. And finally she demonstrated, to her own satisfaction at least, that his charm of manner was of exactly the same sort 
that had been possessed by many other eminently distinguished criminals. How did she do this? My dear sir, you had best inquire of your mother, or your sister, or your wife, or any other lady that your fancy dictates. They know. I am sure I don't. And after it all, Oh, dear, dear, said Margaret. I do wish he didn't have such nice eyes. 6. On the way to luncheon, Mr. Woods came upon Adele Haggage and Hugh Van Orden, both of whom he knew very much engrossed in one another in a nook under the stairway. To Billy it seemed just now quite proper that everyone should be in love. Wasn't it, after all, the most pleasant condition in the world? So he greeted them with a semi-paternal smile that caused Adele to flush a little, for she was, let us say, interested in Mr. Van Orden. That was tolerably well known. In fact, Margaret, prompted by Mrs. Haggage, it must be confessed, had invited him to Selwood for the especial purpose of entertaining Miss Adele Haggage. For he was a good match, and Mrs. Haggage, as an experienced chaperone, knew the value of country houses. Very unexpectedly, however, the boy had developed a disconcerting tendency to fall in love with Margaret, who snubbed him promptly and unmercifully. He had accordingly fallen back on Adele, and Mrs. Haggage had regained both her trust in Providence and her temper. In the breakfast room, where luncheon was laid out, the colonel greeted Mr. Woods with the enthusiasm a sailor shipwrecked on a desert island might conceivably display toward the boat crew come to rescue him. The colonel liked Billy, and furthermore the poor colonel's position at Selwood just now was not utterly unlike that of the supposititious mariner. Were I minded to venture into metaphor, I should picture him as clinging desperately to the rock of an old fogeyism, and surrounded by weltering seas of advanced thought. Colonel Hugonan himself was not advanced in his ideas. Also, he had forceful opinions as to the ultimate destination of those who were. Then Billy was presented to the men of the party, Mr. Felix Canaston and Mr. Petheridge Jukesbury, Mrs. Haggage he knew slightly, and Kathleen Samarez he had known very well indeed some six years previously before she had ever heard of Miguel Samarez, and when Billy was still an undergraduate. She was a widow now, and not well-to-do, and Mr. Woods's first thought on seeing her was that a man was a fool to write verses, and that she looked like just the sort of woman to preserve them. His second was that he had verged on imbecility when he had fancied he admired that slender, dark-haired type. A woman's hair ought to be an enormous coronal of sunlight. A woman ought to have very large, candid eyes of a color between that of sapphires and that of the spring heavens, only infinitely more beautiful than either. And all petticoated persons, differing from this description, were manifestly quite unworthy of any serious consideration. So his eyes turned to Margaret who had no eyes for him. She had forgotten his existence, with an utterness that verged on ostentation, and if it had been any one else, Billy would have surmised she was in a temper. But that angel in a temper? Nonsense! And oh, what eyes she had, and what lashes, and what hair, and altogether how adorable she was, and what a wonder the admiring gods hadn't snatched her up to Olympus long ago. Thus far, Mr. Woods. But if Miss Hugonan was somewhat taciturn, her counselors in diverse schemes for benefiting the universe were an opulent vein. Billy heard them silently. I have spent the entire morning by the lake, Mr. Canaston informed the party at large, in company with a mockingbird who was practicing a new aria. It was a wonderful place. The trees were lisping verses to themselves and the sky overhead was like a robin's egg in color, and a faint wind was making tucks and ruches and pleats all over the water, quite as if the breezes had set up in business as mantua makers. I fancy they thought they were working on a great sheet of blue silk, for it was very like that, and every once in a while a fish would leap and leave a splurge of bubble and foam behind that you would have sworn was an inserted lace medallion. Mr. Canaston, as you are doubtless aware, is the author of The King's Quest and other volumes of verse. He's a full-bodied young man with hair of no particular shade, and if his green eyes are a little aged, his manner is very youthful. His voice in speaking is wonderfully pleasing, and he has a habit of cocking his head on one side in a bird-like fashion. Indeed, 
Mr. Petheridge Jukesbury observed. It is very true that God made the country and man made the town. A little more wine, please. Mr. Jukesbury is a prominent worker in the cause of philanthropy and temperance. He is ponderous and bland, and for the rest he is president of the Society for the Suppression of Nicotine and the Nude, vice president of the Anti-Inebriation League, secretary of the Incorporated Brotherhood of Benevolence, and the bearer of diverse similar honors. I am never really very happy in the country, Mrs. Somers dissented. It reminds me so constantly of our rural drama. I'm always afraid the quartet may come on and sing something. Kathleen Epp Somers, as I hope you do not need to be told, is the well-known lecturer before women's clubs, and the author of many sympathetic stories of nature and animal life, of the kind that have had such a vogue of late. There was always an indefinable air of pathos about her. As Hudson Wick put it, one felt somehow that her mother had been of a domineering disposition, and that she took after her father. "'Ah, dear lady,' Mr. Canaston cried playfully, "'you, like many of us, have become an alien to nature in your quest of a mere earthly paradox. Epigrams are all very well, but I fancy there is more happiness to be derived from a single impulse, from a vernal wood, than from a whole problem play of smart sayings. So few of us are natural.' Mr. Canaston complained with a dulcet sigh. We are too sophisticated. Our very speech lacks the tang of outdoor life. Why should we not love nature, the great mother who is, I grant you, the necessity of various useful inventions in her angry moods, but who, in her kindly moments— He paused with a wry face. I beg your pardon, said he, but I believe I've caught rheumatism lying by that confounded pond. Mrs. Samarez rallied the poet with a pale smile. That comes of communing with nature, she reminded him, and it serves you rightly, for natural communications corrupt good epigrams. I prefer nature with wide margins and uncut leaves. She spoke in her best platform manner. Art should be an expurgated edition of nature, with all the unpleasant parts left out. And I am sure, Mrs. Samarez added, handsomely and clinching her argument, that Mr. Canaston gives us much better sunsets in his poems than I have ever seen in the West. He acknowledged this with a bow. Not sherry. Claret, if you please, said Mr. Jukesbury. Art should be an expurgated edition of nature, he repeated with a suave chuckle. Do you know, I consider that admirably put, Mrs. Samarez. Admirably upon my word. Ah, uh, if our latter-day writers would only take that saying to heart— we do not need to be told of the vice and corruption prevalent, I am sorry to say, among the very best people. What we really need is continually to be reminded of the fact that pure hearts and homes and happy faces are to be found today alike in the palatial residences of the wealthy and in the humbler homes of those less abundantly favored by fortune. And yet, dwelling together in harmony and Christian resignation and, uh, comparatively moderate circumstances. Surely, Mrs. Samaras protested, art has nothing to do with morality. Art is a process. You see a thing in a certain way. You make your reader see it in the same way, or try to. If you succeed, the result is art. If you fail, it may be the book of the year. Enduring immortality and uh, the patronage of the reading public, Mr. Jukesbury placidly insisted, will be awarded in the end only to those who dwell upon the true, the beautiful, and the uh, respectable. Art must cheer. It must be optimistic and edifying and um, suitable for young persons. It must have an uplift, a leaven of righteousness, a, uh, a sort of moral baking powder. It must utterly eschew the... Uh, unpleasant and repugnant details of life. It is, if I may so express myself, not at home in the menage a trois, or, uh, the representation of the nude. Yes, another glass of claret, if you please. I quite agree with you, said Mrs. Haggage in her deep voice. Sarah Ellen Haggage is, of course, the well-known author of Child Labor in the South and The Downtrodden Afro-American and other notable contributions to literature. She is also the Madam President both of the Society for the Betterment of Civic Government and Sewerage 
and of the Ladies League for the edification of the impecunious. And I am glad to see, Mrs. Haggage presently went on, that the literature of the day is so largely beginning to chronicle the sayings and doings of the labouring classes. The virtues of the humble must be admitted in spite of their dissolute and unhygienic tendencies. Yes, Mrs. Haggage added meditatively, our literature is undoubtedly acquiring a more elevated tone. At last we are shaking off the scintillant and unwholesome influence of the French. Ah, the French! sighed Mr. Canaston, a people who think depravity the soul of wit. Their art is mere artfulness. They care nothing for nature. No, Mrs. Haggage assented. They prefer nastiness. All French books are immoral. I ran across one the other day that was simply hideously indecent, unfit for a modest woman to read. And I can assure you that none of its author's other books are any better. I purchased the entire set at once and read them carefully in order to make sure that I was perfectly justified in warning my working girls' classes against them. I wish to misjudge no man, not even a member of a nation notoriously devoted to absinthe and illicit relations. She breathed heavily and looked at Mr. Woods as if somehow he was responsible. Then she gave the name of the book to Petheridge Jukesbury. He wished to have it placed on the Index Expurgatorius of the Brotherhood of Benevolence, he said. Dear, dear, Felix Knaston sighed, as Mr. Jukesbury made a note of it, you are all so practical. You perceive an evil and proceed at once, in your common sense way, to crush it, to stamp it out. Now I can merely lament certain unfortunate tendencies of the age. I am quite unable to contend against them. Do you know, Mr. Knaston continued gaily as he trifled with a bunch of grapes, I feel horribly out of place among you. Here is Mrs. Samarez creating an epidemic of useful and improving knowledge throughout the country by means of her charming lectures. Here is Mrs. Haggage, the mainspring, if I may say so, of any number of educational and philanthropic alarm clocks, which will some day rouse the sleeping public from its lethargy. And here is my friend Jukesbury, whose eloquent pleas for a higher life have turned so many workmen from gin and improvidence, and which in a printed form are disseminated even in such remote regions as Africa, where I am told they have produced the most satisfactory results upon the unsophisticated but polygamous monarchs of that continent. And here, above all, is Miss Hugonin, utilizing the vast power of money, which I am credibly informed is a very good thing to have, though I cannot pretend to speak from experience, and casting whole bakerifuls of bread upon the waters of charity. And here am I, the idle singer of an empty day, a mere drone in this hive of philanthropic bees. Dear, dear, said Mr. Canaston enviously, what a thing it is to be practical. And he laughed toward Margaret in his whimsical way. Miss Hugonin had been strangely silent, but she returned Mr. Canaston's smile and began to take part in the conversation. You're only an ignorant child, she rebuked him, and a very naughty child, too, to make fun of us in this fashion. Yes, Mr. Canaston assented. I am willfully ignorant. The world adores ignorance, and where ignorance is kissed, it is folly to be wise. Tomorrow I shall read you a chapter from my Defense of Ignorance, which my confiding publisher is going to bring out in the autumn. So the table talk went on, and now Margaret bore a part therein. However, I do not think we need record it further. Mr. Woods listened in a sort of daze. Adele Haggage and Hugh Van Orden were conversing in low tones at one end of the table. The colonel was eating his luncheon, silently, and with a certain air of resignation, so Billy Woods was left alone to attend and marvel. The ideas they advanced seemed to him, for the most part, sensible. What puzzled him was the uniform gravity which they accorded equally, as it appeared to him, to the discussion of the most pompous platitudes and of the most arrant nonsense. They were always serious, and the general tone of infallibility, Billy thought, could be warranted only by a vast fund of inexperience. But in the main, they advocated theories he had always held. Excellent theories, he considered, and he was seized with an unreasonable desire to repudiate every one of them, for it seemed to him that every one of them was aimed at Margaret's approval. It did not matter to whom a remark was ostensibly addressed, 
always at its conclusion, the speaker glanced more or less openly toward Miss Hugonin. She was the audience to which they zealously played, thought Billy, and he wondered. I think I have said that, owing to the smallness of the house party, luncheon was served in the breakfast room. The dining room at Selwood is very rarely used because Margaret declares its size makes a meal there equivalent to eating out of doors. And I must confess that the breakfast room is far cozier. The room in the first place is of reasonable dimensions. It is hung with Flemish tapestries from designs by Van Eyck, representing the Four Seasons, but the walls and ceilings are paneled in oak, and over the mantel carved in bass relief the inevitable eagle is displayed. The mantel stood behind Margaret's chair, and over her golden head, half protestingly, half threateningly, with its wings outstretched to the uttermost, the eagle brooded as he had once brooded over Frederick R. Woods. The old man sat contentedly beneath that symbol of what he had achieved in life. He had started, as the phrase runs, from nothing. He had made himself a power. To him the eagle meant that crude, incalculable power of wealth he gloried in. And to Billy Woods, the eagle meant identically the same thing, and, I am sorry to say, he began to suspect that the eagle was really the audience to whom Miss Hugonin's friends so zealously played. Perhaps the misanthropy of Mr. Woods was not wholly unconnected with the fact that Margaret never looked at him. She'd show him, the fortune hunter. So her eyes never strayed toward him, and her attention never left him. At the end of luncheon she could have enumerated for you every morsel he had eaten, every glare he had directed toward Canaston, every beseeching look he had turned to her. Of course he had taken sherry, dry sherry. Hadn't he told her, four years ago, it was the first day she'd ever worn the white organdy dotted with purple sprigs, and they sat by the lake so late that afternoon that Frederick R. Woods finally sent for them to come to dinner. Hadn't he told her then that only women and children cared for sweet wines? Of course he had. The villain. Billy, too, had his emotions. To hear that paragon, that queen among women, discant of work done in the slums and of the mysteries of sweatshops, to hear her state offhand that there were seventeen hundred fifty thousand children among the ages of ten and fifteen years employed in the mines and factories of the United States, to hear her discourse of foreign missions as glibly as though she had been born and nurtured in Zambezi land. All these things filled him with an odd sense of alienation. He wasn't worthy of her, and that was a fact. He was only a dumb idiot, and half the words that were falling thick and fast from philanthropic lips about him might as well have been hailstones. For all the benefit he was deriving from them, he couldn't understand half, she said. In consequence, he very cordially detested the people who could, especially that grimacing ass Canaston. Altogether, neither Mr. Woods nor Miss Hugonin got much comfort from their luncheon. 7. After luncheon, Billy had a quiet half-hour with the colonel in the smoking-room. Said Billy, between puffs of a cigar, Peggy's changed a bit, the colonel grunted. Perhaps he dared not trust to words. Seems to have made some new friends, a more vigorous grunt. Cultured lot they seem, said Mr. Woods. Anxious to do good in the world, too. Philanthropic, said, eh? A snort this time. Eh? Uh, said Mr. Woods. There was dawning suspicion in his tone. The colonel looked about him. "'My boy,' said he, "'you think your stars you don't get that money. "'And depend upon it, there never was a gold ship yet that wasn't followed.' "'Pirates?' Billy Wood suggested helpfully. "'Pirates are human beings,' said Colonel Hugonin with dignity. "'Sharks, my boy. Sharks.' Eight. That evening, after proper deliberation, Celestine, Miss Hugonin commanded, Get out that little yellow dress with the little red bandana handkerchiefs on it. And for heaven's sake, stop pulling my hair out by the roots, unless you want a raving maniac on your hands, Celestine. Whereby she had landed me in a quandary. For how, pray, is it possible for me, a simple-minded male, fittingly to depict for you the clothes of Margaret, the innumerable vanities, the quaint devices, the pleasing conceits with which she delighted to enhance her comeliness? The thing is beyond me. Let us keep discreetly out of her wardrobe, you and I. Otherwise I should have to prattle of an infinity of mysteries, of her scarfs, feathers, laces, gloves, girdles, knots, hats, shoes, fans, and slippers, 
of her embroideries, rings, pins, pendants, ribbons, spangles, bracelets, and chains. In fine, there would be no end to the list of gewgaws that went to make Margaret Hugonan even more adorable than nature had fashioned her. For when you come to think of it, it takes the craft and skill and life-work of a thousand men to dress one girl properly. And in Margaret's case, I protest that every one of them, could he have beheld the result of their united labors, would have so gloried in his own part therein that there would have been no putting up with any of the lot. Yet when I think of the tiny shoes she affected, patent leather ones mostly, with a seam running straight up the middle, and you may guess the exact date of our comedy by knowing in what year these shoes were modish, the string of fat pearls she so often wore about her round full throat, the white frock, say, with arabesques of blue all over it, that Felix Canaston said reminded him of Ruskin's tombstone, or that other white and blue one, Décolleté, that was which I swear seraphic mantua makers had woven out of mists and the skies of June. When I remember these things, I repeat, almost am I tempted to become a bootmaker, and a lapidary, and a milliner, and in fight an adept in all the other arts and trades and sciences that go to make a well-groomed American girl what she is. The incredible fruit of grafted centuries, the period after the list of time's achievements, just that I might describe Margaret to you properly. But the thing is beyond me. I leave such considerations then to Celestine, and resolve for the future rigorously to eschew all such gods. Meanwhile, if an untutored masculine description will content you, Margaret, I have on reliable feminine authority, was one of the very few blondes whose complexions can carry off reds and yellows. This particular gown, I remember it perfectly, was of a dim, dull yellow, flounceful, if I may coin a word, diaphanous, expansive. I have not the least notion what fabric composed it, but scattered about it in unexpected places were diamond-shaped red things that I am credibly informed are called medallions. The general effect of it may be briefly characterized as grateful to the eye and dangerous to the heart, and to a rational train of thought quite fatal, for it was cut low in the neck, and Margaret's neck and shoulders would have drawn madrigals from a bench of bishops. And in consequence, Billy Woods ate absolutely no dinner that evening. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Eagle's Shadow by James Branch Cabell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Originally recorded by John M. Wilson for Bureau 42, donated to LibriVox with his express permission. 9. It was an hour or two later when the moon, drifting tardily up from the south, found Miss Hugonan and Mr. Canaston chatting amicably together in the court at Selwood. They were discussing the deplorable tendencies of the modern drama. The court at Selwood lies in the angle of the building, the ground plane of which is L-shaped. Its two outer sides are formed by covered cloisters leading to the palm garden, and by moonlight, the night bland and sweet with the odor of growing things, vocal with plashing fountains, spangled with fireflies that flicker indolently among a glimmering concourse of nymphs and fawns eternally postured in flight or in pursuit. By moonlight, I say, the court at Selwood is perhaps as satisfactory a spot for a tete-a-tete -tete as this transitory world affords. Mr. Canaston was in vain tonight. He scintillated. He was also a bit nervous. This was probably owing to the fact that Margaret, leaning against the back of the stone bench on which they both sat, her chin propped by her hand, was gazing at him in that peculiar, intent fashion of hers which, as I think I have mentioned, caused you fatuously to believe she had forgotten there were any other trousered beings extant. Mr. Canaston, however, stuck to apt phrases and nice distinctions. The moon found it edifying, but rather dull. After a little, Mr. Canaston paused in his boyish, ebullient speech, and they sat in silence. The lisping of the fountains was very audible. In the heavens, the moon climbed a little further and registered a manifestly impossible hour on the sundial. It also brightened. It was a companionable sort of a moon. It invited talk of a confidential nature, 
Bless my soul, it was signaling to any number of gentlemen at that moment. There's only you and I and the girl here. Speak out, man. She'll have you now if she ever will. You'll never a chance like this again, I can tell you. Come now, my dear boy. I'm shining full in your face, and you've no idea how becoming it is. I'm not like that garish, blundering son, who doesn't know any better than to let her see how red and fidgety you get when you're excited. I'm an old hand at such matters. I've presided over these little affairs since Babylon was a paltry village. I'll never tell. And, and if anything should happen, I'm always ready to go behind a cloud, you know. So speak out. Speak out, man, if you've the heart of a mouse. Thus far, the conscienceless spring moon. Mr. Canaston sighed. The moon took this as a promising sign and brightened over it perceptibly, and thereby afforded him an excellent gambit. Yes, said Margaret. What is it, beautiful? That, in privacy, was her fantastic name for him. The poet laughed a little. Beautiful child, said he. And that, under similar circumstances, was his perfectly reasonable name for her. I have been discourteous. To be frank, I have been sulking as irrationally as a baby who clamors for the moon yonder. You aren't really anything but a baby, you know. Indeed, Margaret almost thought of him as such. He was so delightfully naive. He bent toward her. A faint tremor woke in his speech. And so, said he softly, I cry for the moon, the unattainable, exquisite moon. It is very ridiculous, is it not? But he did not look at the moon. He looked toward Margaret past margaret toward the gleaming windows of selwood where the eagle brooded oh i really can't say margaret cried in haste she was kind to endymion you know we will hope for the best i think we'd better go into the house now you bid me hope said he beautiful if you really want the moon i don't see the least objection to your continuing to hope they make so many little airships and things nowadays you know and you'll probably find it only green cheese after all what is green cheese i wonder it sounds horribly indigestible and unattractive doesn't it miss eugonan babbled in a tumult of fear and disappointment he was about to spoil their friendship now men were so utterly inconsiderate i'm a little cold said she mendaciously i really must go in he detained her surely he breathed you must know what i have so long wanted to tell you i haven't the least idea she protested promptly you can tell me all about it in the morning I have some accounts to cast up tonight. Besides, I'm not a good person to tell secrets to. You, you'd you much better not tell me. Oh, really, Mr. Canaston? She cried earnestly. You'd much better not tell me. Ah, oh, Margaret, Margaret, he pleaded. I am not adamant. I am only a man with a man's heart that hungers for you, cries for you, clamors for you day by day. I love you, beautiful child. Love you with a poet's love that is alien to these sordid days with a love that is half worship i love you as leander loved his hero as pyramus loved thisbe ah child child how beautiful you are you are fairest of created women child fair as those long dead queens for whose smiles old cities burned and kingdoms were lightly lost i am mad for love of you ah have pity upon me margaret for i love you very tenderly he delivered these observations with appropriate fervor. Mr. Canaston, said she, I am sorry. We got along so nicely before, and I was so proud of your friendship. We've had such good times together, you and I, and I've liked your verses so, and I've liked you. Oh, please, please, let's keep on being just friends, Margaret wailed piteously. Friends, he cried, and gave a bitter laugh. I was never friends with you, Margaret. Why, even as I read my verses to you, those pallid, ineffectual verses that praised you timorously under varied names, even then there pulsed in my veins the riotous peon of love, the great mad song of love that shamed my paltry rhymes. I cannot be friends with you, child. I must have all or nothing. Bid me hope or go. Miss Hugonin meditated for a moment and did neither. Beautiful she presently queried would you be very very much shocked if i descended to slang i think said he with an uncertain smile that i could endure it why then cut it out beautiful cut it out i don't believe a word you've said in the first place and anyhow it annoys me 
to have you talk to me like that. I don't like it, and it simply makes me awfully, awfully tired. With which characteristic speech, Miss Hugonin leaned back and sat up very rigidly and smiled at him like a cherub. Canaston groaned. It shall be as you will, he assured her, with a little quaver in his speech that was decidedly effective. And in any event, I am not sorry that I have loved you, beautiful child. You have always been a power for good in my life. You have gladdened me with the vision of a beauty that is more than human. You have heartened me for this petty business of living. You have praised my verses. You have even accorded me certain pecuniary assistance as to their publication, though I must admit that to accept it of you is very distasteful to me. Ah, <sighs> Felix Knaston cried with a quick lift of his speech. Impractical child that I am, I had not thought of that. My love had caused me to forget the great barrier that stands between us. He gasped and took a short turn about the court. Pardon me, Miss Hugonin, he entreated, when his emotions were under a little better control, for having spoken as I did, I had forgotten. Think of me, if you will, as no better than the others. Think of me as a mere fortune hunter. My presumption will be justly punished. Oh, no, no, it isn't that, she cried. It isn't that, is it? You, you would care just as much about me if I were poor, wouldn't she, beautiful? I don't want you to care for me, of course, Margaret added with haste. I want to go on being friends. Oh, that money, that nasty money, she cried in a sudden gust of petulance. It makes me so distrustful, and I can't help it. He smiled at her wistfully. My dear, said he, are there no mirrors at Selwood to remove your doubts? I, yes, I do believe in you, she said at length, but I don't want to marry you. You see, I'm not a bit in love with you, Margaret explained candidly. Ensued a silence. Mr. Canaston bowed his head. You bid me go, said he. No, not exactly, said she. He indicated a movement toward her. Now you needn't attempt to take any liberties with me, Miss Hugonin announced decisively, because if you do, I'll never speak to you again. You must let me go now. You, you must let me think. Then Felix Canaston acted very wisely. He rose and stood aside with a little bow. I can wait, child, he said sadly. I have already waited a long time. Miss Hugonin escaped into the house without further delay. It was very flattering, of course. He had spoken beautifully, she thought, and nobly and poetically and considerately, and altogether there was absolutely no excuse for her being in a temper. Still, she was. The moon, however, considered the affair as arranged for she had been no whit more resolute in her refusal, you see, than becomes any self-respecting maid. In fact, she had not refused him, and the experienced moon had seen the hopes of many a wooer thrive, chameleon-like, on answers far less encouraging than that which Margaret had given Felix Canaston. Margaret was very fond of him, all women like a man who can do a picturesque thing without bothering to consider whether or not he be making himself ridiculous and more than once in thinking of him she had wondered if, perhaps, possibly, some day, and always those vague flights of fancy had ended at this precise point, incinerated, if you'll grant me the simile, by the sudden flaming of her cheeks. The thing is common enough. You may remember that Romeo was not the only gentleman that Juliet noticed at her debut. There was the young Petruchio, and the son and heir of old Tiberio and I do not question that she had a kind glance or so for County Paris. Beyond doubt, there were many with whom my lady had danced, with whom she had laughed a little, with whom she had exchanged a few perfectly affable words and looks, when, of a sudden, her heart speaks. Who is he that would not dance? If he be married, my grave is like to prove my marriage bed. In any event, Paris and Petruchio and Tiberio's young hopeful can go hang. Romeo has come. Romeo is seldom the first. Pray you, what was there to prevent Juliet from admiring so-and-so's dancing, or from observing that Signor Such-an-One had remarkably expressive eyes, or from thinking of Tybalt as a dear, reckless fellow whom it was the duty of some good woman to rescue from perdition? If no one blames the young Montague for sending Rosalind to the right about, Rosalind for whom he was weeping and rhyming an hour before, why, pray, should not Signorina Capulet have had a few previous affaires de cure? Depend upon it, she had, for was she not already past thirteen? In like manner, I dare say that a deal passed between Desdemona and Cassio that the honest Moor never knew of, 
and that Lucretia was probably very pleasant and agreeable to Tarquin, as a well-bred hostess should be, and that Helen had that little affair with Theseus before she ever thought of Paris, and that if Cleopatra died for love of Antony, it was not until she had previously lived a great while with Caesar. So Felix Canaston had his hour. Now Margaret had gone into Selwood, flame-faced and quite unconscious that she is humming under her breath the words of a certain inane old song. Oh, she sat for me a chair, she has ringlets in her hair. She's a young thing and cannot leave her mother. Only she sang it father. And afterward she suddenly frowned and stamped her foot, did Margaret. I hate him, said she, but she looked very guilty. 10. In the living hall of Selwood, Miss Hugonan paused. Undeniably, there were the accounts of the Ladies' League for the edification of the impecunious to be put in order. Her monthly report as treasurer was due in a few days, and Margaret was in such matters a careful, painstaking body, and not wholly dependent upon her secretary. But she was entirely too much out of temper to attend to that now. It was really all Mr. Canaston's fault, she assured a pricking conscience, as she went out on the terrace before Selwood. He had bothered her dreadfully. There she found Petheridge Jukesbury smoking placidly in the effulgence of the moonlight, and the rotund, pasty countenance he turned toward her was ludicrously like the moon's counterfeit in muddy water. I am sorry to admit, but Mr. Jukesbury had dined somewhat injudiciously. You are not to stretch the phrase, he was merely prepared to accord the universe his approval, to pat destiny upon the head, and his thoughts ran clear enough, but with Aprilian counterchanges of the jovial and the lachrymous. Ah, Miss Hugonan, he greeted her with a genial smile. I am indeed fortunate. You find me in deep meditation, and also, I am sorry to say, in the practice of a most pernicious habit. You do not object? Ah, that is so like you. You are always kind, Miss Hugonan. Your kindness, which falls, if I may so express myself, as the gentle rain from heaven upon all deserving charitable institutions, and daily comforts the destitute with good advice, and consoles the sorrowing with blankets, would now induce you to tolerate an odor which I am sure is personally distasteful to you. But really, I don't mind, was Margaret's protest. I cannot permit it, Mr. Jukesbury insisted and waved a pudgy hand in the moonlight. No, really, I cannot permit it. We will throw it away, if you please, and say no more about it. And his glance followed the glowing light of his cigar end, somewhat wistfully. Your father's cigars are such as it is seldom my privilege to encounter, but then my personal habits are not luxurious, nor my private income precisely what my childish imaginings had pictured it at this comparatively advanced period of life. Ah, uh, youth, youth! As the poet admirably says, Miss Hugonan, the thoughts of youth are long, long thoughts, but its visions of existence are rose-tinged and free from care, and its conception of the responsibilities of manhood, such as taxes and the water rate, I may safely characterize as extremely sketchy. But pray be seated, Miss Hugonan, Petheridge Jukesbury blandly urged. Common courtesy forced her to comply, so Margaret seated herself on a little red rustic bench. In the moonlight, but I think I have mentioned how Margaret looked in the moonlight, and above her golden head the eagle, sculptured over the doorway, stretched his wings to the uttermost, half protectingly, half threateningly, and seemed to view Mr. Jukesbury with a certain air of expectation. A beautiful evening, Petheridge Jukesbury suggested, after a little cogitation. She conceded that this was undeniable. Where nature smiles and only the conduct of man is vile and altogether what it ought not to be, he continued with unction. Ah, oh, how true that is and how consoling. It is a good thing to meditate upon our own vileness, Miss Hugonan, to reflect that we are but worms with naturally the most vicious inclinations. It is most salutary. Even I am but a worm, Miss Hugonan, though the press has been pleased to speak most kindly of me. Even you— Ah, oh, no, cried Mr. Jukesbury, kissing his fingertips with gallantry. Let us say a worm who has burst its cocoon and become a butterfly. A butterfly with a charming face and a most charitable disposition and considerable property. Margaret thanked him with a smile, 
and began to think, wistfully, of the Ladies' League accounts. Still, he was a good man, and she endeavored to persuade herself that she considered his goodness to atone for his flabbiness and his fleshiness and his interminable verbosity, which she didn't. Mr. Jukesbury sighed. A naughty world, said he with pathos, a very naughty world, which really does not deserve the honor of including you in its census reports. Yet I dare say it has the effrontery to put you down in the tax lists. It even puts me down. Me, an humble worker in the vineyard with both hands set to the plow. And if I don't pay up, it sells me out. A very naughty world indeed. I dare say, Mr. Jukesbury observed, raising his eyes, not toward heaven, but toward the eagle, that its conduct, as the poet says, creates considerable distress among the angels. I don't know. I am not acquainted with many angels. My wife was an angel, but she is now a lifeless form. She has been for five years. I erected a tomb to her at considerable personal expense, but I don't begrudge it. No, I don't begrudge it, Miss Hugonan. She was very hard to live with, but she was an angel. And angels are rare. Miss Hugonan, said Petheridge Jukesbury with emphasis, you are an angel. Oh, dear, dear, said Margaret to herself. I do wish I'd gone to bed directly after dinner. Above them the eagle brooded. Surely, he breathed, you must know what I have so long wanted to tell you. No, said Margaret, and I don't want to know, please. You make me awfully tired, and I don't care for you in the least. Now you let go my hand. Let go at once, he detained her. You are an angel, he insisted, an angel with a large property. I love you, Margaret. Be mine. Be my blushing bride, I entreat you. Your property is far too large for an angel to look after. You need a man of affairs. I am a man of affairs. I am forty-five and have no bad habits. My press notices are, as a rule, favorable. My eloquence is accounted considerable, and my dearest aspiration is that you will comfort my declining years. I might add that I adore you, but I think I mentioned that before. Margaret, will you be my blushing bride? No, said Miss Hugonan emphatically. No, you tipsy old beast. No. There was a rustle of skirts, the door slammed, and the philanthropist was left alone on the terrace. 11. In the living hall, Margaret came upon Hugh Van Orden, who was searching in one of the alcoves for a piece of music that Adele Haggage wanted and had misplaced. The boy greeted her miserably. Miss Hugonan, he lamented, you're awfully hard on me. I am sorry, said Miss Hugonan, that you consider me discourteous to a guest in my own house. Oh, I grant you Margaret was in a temper now. It isn't that, he protested, but I never see you alone, and I've had something to tell you. Yes, said she coldly. He drew near to her. Surely, he breathed, you must know what I have long wanted to tell you. Yes, I should think I did, said Margaret, and if you dare tell me a word of it, I'll never speak to you again. It's getting a little monotonous. Good night, Mr. Van Orden. Halfway up the stairs, she paused and ran lightly back. Oh, Hugh, Hugh, she said contritely. I was unpardonably rude. I'm sorry, dear, but it's quite impossible. You are a dear, cute little boy, and I love you. But not that way. So let's shake hands, Hugh, and be friends, and then you can go and play with Adele. He raised her hand to his lips. He really was a nice boy. But, oh, dear, said Margaret when he had gone, what horrid creatures men are, and what a temper I'm in, and what a vexatious place the world is. I wish I were a pauper. I wish I had never been born, and I wish... And I wish I had those league papers fixed. I'll do it tonight. I'm sure I need something tranquilizing, like assessments and decimal places and unpaid dues to keep me from screaming. I hate them all, all three of them, as badly as I do him. Thereupon she blushed, for no apparent reason, and went to her own rooms in a frame of mind that was inexcusable, but very becoming. Her cheeks burned, her eyes flashed with a brighter glow that was gem-like and a little cruel and her chin tilted up defiantly. Margaret has a resolute chin, a masculine chin. I fancy that it was only at the last moment that nature found it a thought too boyish and modified it with a dimple. 
a very creditable dimple, by the way, that she must have been really proud of. That ridiculous little dint saved it, feminized it. Altogether, then, she swept down upon the papers of the Ladies' League for the edification of the impecunious with very much the look of a diminutive Valkyrie, a Valkyrie of unusual personal attractions, you understand, en route for the battlefield and a little, a very little eager and expectant of the strife. Subsequently, oh dear, dear, said she, amid a feverish rustling of papers, the whole world is out of sorts tonight. I never did know how much seven times eight is, and I hate everybody, and I've left that list of unpaid dues in Uncle Fred's room, and I've got to go after it, and I don't want to bother those little suitors of mine. Miss Hugonan rose and went out from her own rooms, carrying a bunch of keys, across the hallway to the room in which Frederick R. Woods had died. It was his study, you may remember. It had been little used since his death, but Margaret kept her less important papers there. The overflow, the flotsam of her vast philanthropic and educational correspondence. And there she found Billy Woods. End of chapter 11